Heavenly Father, we thank you for our leaders' development meeting. We're asking, Lord, that you bless your people today in Jesus' name. Reveal your mind to us. Show us our responsibility and grant us the grace to effectively carry out everything you've called us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen before you sit down. Thank you. God bless you. You can sit down. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. When I went into Macedonia. That thou mightest charge some. That they teach no other doctrine. I besought thee to abide. Abide still at Ephesus. When God calls us, when God appoints us, and He puts us in a place of ministry, we need to abide there. We need to stay there. We need to dig deep and affirm our ministry there and do everything He has called us to in that same place. There are people that have the habit of being here and there, and they spread themselves so thin that they don't, they don't make any impact. And they don't have any fruit for their labor. It reminds us of the man that spoke, actually a prophet, we're looking at First Kings chapter 20, that spoke to the king and revealed to the king he had a duty, he had a responsibility, but he didn't abide in that responsibility. He didn't stay with that work. Look at what he said. He said in verse 39, And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, a man turned aside and brought a man to me and said, Keep this man. I was supposed to keep the converts. Keep this man. Like we're supposed to keep the congregation, the fold, the flock. Keep this man. Like we're supposed to keep the converts that the Lord has given us. Keep this man. Abide in that place. Abide in that ministry. Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. Look at this, verse 40. And as thy servant, tell me, was busy here and there. He was busy here and there. He let the work he should have done. As a servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thyself has decided it. What's the consequence? When you are not abiding, you have a ministry, you have a calling, you have a commission. And you have something the Lord has given you to do in the household of faith. But you are not abiding. What happens? We're looking at Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, here Jesus gave a parable. And this parable reminds us that we need to watch if there is any kind of spirit within us, attitude within us, habit within us, that will be here and there. We just like adventure. And we like running here and running there. But the real work the Lord has given us, we're not concentrating on that work. And we're not improving on the things that we ought to do. That is, you abide there, you see the need there, you develop yourself there, and then you're ministering to the needs of the people. You do it every week, every month, and year after year, so that you can effectively do what the Lord has called you to do. What if we don't do that? Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 24. Another parable puts you forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed 
in his field. But while men slept, this one is not just busy here and there, he sleeps. While men slept, while the ministers slept, while the ministers are not concentrating on what the Lord has given them to do, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. And then it goes on to say that everything grew, but the seed, the wheat, as well as the tares, and later they discovered, which is telling us that if we neglect our ministry, if we don't know the purpose for which we're called, we might be like these people, either we're busy on non-essentials, or we're busy on things that are not related to our ministry, not related to our calling, and then we make a shipwreck of the faith, or we just sleep. We're ignorant of the needs of the congregation. And we're ignorant of the responsibility the Lord has called us to. And eventually the work is spoiled. We're coming back to First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy, you know why you are there at Ephesus? That you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This tells us not just a calling, not just a commission, but the purpose for that calling. And Paul, the apostle, was a minister that knew, an apostle that knew the purpose of God for his calling. And you see why God called him. And he passed that on. He walked with a purpose. He walked with a blue plan. He walked with a pattern that the Lord had called him to. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Whatever others do, here is your goal. Whatever others do not do, here is your assignment. Whether the other people around you understand or not, here is what I called you for. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen. Don't leave that out. What you have seen? You have seen that Jesus is Lord. He spoke to you and called you from heaven. You heard that voice. And you said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So, that's what you have heard. That's what you have seen. Go tell everybody that Jesus is the Christ and Jesus is Lord. And of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Here is the calling. Here is the commission. I still appear to you. I'll teach you a lot of things. And everything you have seen, everything I'm going to teach you, you deliver that to all the people you are going to. We're looking at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither received I, neither for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but, tell me there, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what he told him, I will appear to you, I will teach you the gospel. I will reveal the fullness of the gospel to you, the gospel that saves and the gospel that sanctifies, and the gospel that empowers us and fills us, immerses us in the Holy Ghost, and the gospel that prepares us for the coming of the Lord. I will appear to you and teach you everything, deliver that. And Paul the Apostle said, oh, Timothy, I know the reason why I'm called. I know the reason I'm commissioned, and I'm at that. I keep at that. I don't go this way or go that way. I'm not a man that goes here and there. I just keep to that that has called me to. We're looking at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. For this cause, let I thee increase. 
that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. Titus, you are called, you are commissioned, you are appointed, and here is what you are to do. You see, all these uh, ministers we are talking about, they knew their calling. Paul the Apostle knew his calling. Timothy knew his calling. Titus knew his calling. I've put you there, I've appointed you there, and I've placed you there so that you will search in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. We're coming back to First Timothy chapter 1. Know your calling. Understand your calling. Appreciate your calling. Stay by your calling. Remain in that calling. Do what the Lord has called you to do so that on the final day there will be well done. You receive the commendation of the Lord in Jesus' name. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. When I went into Macedonia. You see the, the Lord called Paul the apostle. He knew that. And the Lord called Timothy. And he knew that. And there is no conflict in the calling. I am going to Macedonia. Can I follow you? No. Abide in Ephesus. I am going to Macedonia. Why are you not abiding with me here? Because I have the purpose, I have the goal. I know what he has called me for. I'm supposed to go here and go there and go there and go to all those places and do what he called me to do. And the rest of us do exactly that. Not really. Titus, remain in Crete. Timothy, remain in Ephesus. And do and fulfill your calling. You'll fulfill your calling in Jesus' name. No conflict of interest. No competition with one another. And there is no canal comparison between this and that. I do what he has called me to do. You do what he has called you to do. And then we succeed in ministry. And this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. The latter part of verse 3. That that might as charge some. Charge some. That they teach no other doctrine. That word charge. Command them. And tell them this command. This charge. It's coming from heaven. It's a divine charge. Charge them. It's a constant charge. Charge them. It's a compelling charge. Charge them at all times. Charge them. Give them the charge. In season and out of season, it's a charge for a lifetime. As long as we remain there, Timothy, it's not that I did it last week. I did it last month. I did it the other time. I'm not going to go to another thing. It's a lifetime charge. Anytime you see somebody coming up with something strange, coming up with something you know, that will not bless the soul of man, it says keep on charging them. A charge. It's a charge for ministers, for the messengers of God. It's a charge for leaders. And here we are. We're leaders in the gospel and leaders in the vineyard, vineyard of the Lord. And it says we charge them. It's for workers. It's for disciples. It's for all pregnancies. It's for all sons and daughters of the Lord. A charge. It's a duty. This is not like, I'm not cut out for that. That's not my nature. I don't think I can do that because in my nature I don't like to be that confrontational and charge anyone. It's a duty. Charge them. It's a responsibility. Charge them. It is something that must be done. Charge them. It's a charge to be obeyed. Charge them. It's a charge that you continue therein. It's a charge to be faithful. We're looking at First uh, Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six. I read from verse thirteen. I give the charge in the sight of God. Here comes Paul the apostle. 
is still repeating that word. It says, Timothy, you are there for a purpose. You wake up in the morning. You're going to prepare your message. You're not preparing your message in isolation. You're not preparing your message as to, this is what I like. This is what the people want. Not what you like. Not what they want. There is a charge, a divine charge upon your life. I give thee charge in the sight of God. Who quickness all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate, witness a good profession that thou keep this commandment without spot. That is, the charge I bring to you is that you brace up yourself, you buckle your belt, and you tighten up everything, and you say, I'm going to give this all the courage, all the conviction it requires, because it's a charge that you must keep. And you keep the commandment without spot or rebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something you retire from. It's not something that you say, you know, we used to do that many years ago, you know. We used to correct people. We used to have conviction. And we used to stand uncompromisingly on the word of God. It says, this is what you are to keep without sport or rebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at second. Timothy chapter 4, a charge. Second Timothy chapter 4, I read from verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God. You'll not say you didn't hear, I'm telling you this one before God. You'll not say it was just a casual meeting that Paul told me that. No, I'm telling you this before God. I charge thee therefore before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his, at his appearing and his kingdom, was the charge? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, without long suffering and doctrine. I pray we'll keep the church. Are you there? I said I pray we'll keep the church. The message tonight, a compelling charge for Christian ministers. A compelling charge for Christian ministers. We're dividing this to, point, to three points. Number one, remaining a fundamental teacher with the master. Remaining. A fundamental teacher with the master. Number two, restraining false teachers from ministering. Restraining false teachers from ministering. Number three, reproducing faithful teachers for multiplication. Reproducing faithful teachers for multiplication. Let's look at this. We're coming back to First Timothy chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 3. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. If he's going to understand no other doctrine, he must know the central doctrine. He must know the fundamental doctrine. He must know the essential doctrine. How do you charge other people to say, no, don't teach that? Because you know what to teach. Because you know the very central teaching and doctrine of the word of God that brings salvation. That, prepare us, that prepares us for heaven. Because you know the doctrine that they ought to teach. Fundamental. The, the same thing that Jesus did. That's how you can charge them. That's how you can challenge them. That's why you can tell them, no, that's going astray. No, that's not the right doctrine. No, that's not the right way. Because you know the right way. In fact, you look at the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and you look at what he did and how he did it because he is the one that taught the fundamental doctrine. Fundamental. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we're reading from verse 16. And he sent out unto him the disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. Before you can charge other people not to teach other doctrine, you must be like Jesus Christ. Number one, you're true. And then he goes on to say, and teaches the way of God in truth. The way of God in truth. You're not teaching the traditions of men. You're not teaching the traditions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You're not teaching the modern, psychedelic kind of doctrine, just to make people happy and to dance and to sing and all that. You're not teaching something temporary. You're teaching them something that is eternal and something that brings life eternal unto them, like Jesus Christ that teaches the way of God in truth. Timothy, you must be a fundamental teacher yourself. The teacher of fundamental doctrine that gets us out of the world into the kingdom of God. Look at that verse 16. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of man. That's the teacher you ought to be, like Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about, remaining a fundamental teacher with the master. That's how he did it. And what did he commit into our hands? Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's Timothy, that's what you're to do. And ministers of God, leaders in the kingdom of God, that's what we're to do. Everything he taught, he taught about being born again. He taught about being sanctified. He taught about being righteous. He taught about being holy. He taught about inward righteousness. He taught about heaven. He taught about the kingdom of God. And the Lord says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he says, and lo, I am with you always. He'll be with you. I said he'll be with you. He will give you backbone. He will give you conviction. And then you'll be able to stand in the strength of the Lord. And this work will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You see, those apostles of the Lord, those disciples of the Lord, that's exactly what he did. We're looking at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 19. But the angel of the Lord, by night, opened the prison doors. All your prison doors are open. And brought them forth and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people. All the words of this life. All the words of this life. Fundamental. All the words of this life. Foundational. All the words of this life. The word that brings salvation. The word that gives us security in Christ. Go and teach them all the words of this life. And when they had that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they were, uh, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they found them not in the prison. You will not be in the prison. And they returned and told them. And then they say, saying, the prison really found we short with all safety. And the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we opened, we found no man therein. And then they said, we don't know where this will grow. But eventually, they found them, they were teaching. Verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple. Tell me. Tell me out loud. Tell me as if that's what you are going to do. And teaching the people. Teaching the people. They cared not for imprisonment or any other thing. They taught the people. You will teach the people. 
We're looking at verse 42. And daily in the temple. Daily in the temple. Daily in the temple. And in every house. They cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. And to preach Jesus Christ. That's what they were preaching. That's what we are to preach. He's sufficient for us. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. Our sufficiency. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. Colossians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 28. Whom we preach. We don't do any other thing. Whom we preach. That's how we exist. Whom we preach. That's our calling. Whom we preach. That's our commission. Whom we preach. That's something Satan will not take away from your hand. Whom we preach. That's something society will not take away from us. Whom we preach. That's something recession, farming, whatever economic condition we have in the country will not take this one away from us. Whom we preach. We'll preach it in the day. We'll preach it in the night. We'll preach it while we're young. We'll preach it as we're getting old. In fact, it says, as your days are, tell me, so your, so your strength be. The Lord wants you to be strong until your old age. You will not retire. Amen. You will not retreat. Amen. And you will not go back from the work of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever the argument outside there, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's our goal. That's our purpose. That's what we are going to keep on doing. Remaining a fundamental teacher. With the master. We are coming back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee. That thou by them might test war a good warfare. You know, sometimes it's like battle. Battling for the souls of men. Fighting to recover, rescue the people that are lost. But say charge. Verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience. Holding faith and a good conscience. Nobody will take it away from you. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ. I lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Chapter 3 verse 9. In chapter 3 verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. It says, as I am preaching the gospel, I am declaring the word of God. I also keep it. I live by it so that I have a clear conscience, a good conscience. Chapter 4, we're looking at verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Timothy, Everything you've learned, everything you've received, and you saw from me and in me, continue in that. So that you're reminding the people of God of those cardinal teachings of the word of God every time. Look at verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Look at verse 15. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them. That thy profiting may appear to all, take it unto thyself, and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Timothy, you are not just there to fill in the space, empty space. You are there to get people saved. And you are there to retain your own salvation and your conviction as well. In doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. We're looking at chapter 5. In chapter 5, here he tells us in verse 20. Because this is the charge he gave to Timothy and this is the charge he's giving us. In verse 20, he tells us, them that sin, what do you do? Rebuke them. 
in the room, privately, behind the curtain. Tell me out loud. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also tell me may fear. Verse 21, I charge thee before God. That's the charge. Timothy, you have a charge. It's a divine charge. And it's coming from heaven. This is not something you will say, I have a timid nature. I have a fearful nature. I cannot stand up before people and confront them. But you have a calling. And you have a commission. And you have a charge. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Let's say that together. Doing nothing by partiality. Let's say that again. Doing nothing by partiality. You're not looking at people and say, because of his height, I cannot tell him that. Because of his certificate, I cannot tell him that. Because he's an elite insider, I cannot tell him that. Because he's an old timer, I cannot tell him that. Are you not the pastor there? The Lord has put you there and he wants you to affirm the truth. Because of their reaction, I cannot tell them that. Because I don't know what their response will be, I cannot tell them that uh -uh. you preach the word and it says doing nothing by partiality. The Lord will help you. Amen. We're looking at chapter 6. In chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 13. I give the charge. In the sight of God, who quickness all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate, witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without sport. Or rebukeable. Until you are tired. Until you retire. What does it say there? Are you planning on retiring? I can't hear my people. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. It's like he's looking at you face to face. And he's saying, in that location where you are, in that evangelistic field where you are, in that pastoral duty responsibility where you are, Keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing at edge concerning the faith, grace be with you. Second Timothy chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen. Hold fast the form of sound words. Which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. It's still giving the charge. It's saying, Timothy, you understand the depth of your calling. You understand the breadth of your calling. You understand the height of your calling. You hold fast. Verse 14. That good thing which is committed to thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. We're looking at chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 15. It tells us in verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, you see, in all the chapters, it's reminding him, you have a calling, you have a commission. And you want to make full proof of that ministry. That's why it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. We're looking at chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 3, I'm reading, let's read from verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and, uh, and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at this, verse 14. But tell me the word there. Don't feel tired. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, 
knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We're looking at chapter 4. In chapter 4, here it tells us now from verse 1, I chat thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, will you? Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall be heaped to themselves, teachers having itching ears. That's what has happened in many assemblies, in many churches. In many generation, uh, this generation churches, that they have uh, kicked away and they have abandoned the real word of God. It's that they have itching ears. They want somebody to come and tickle them. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things and deal affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. God will help all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 9. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word, as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Titus chapter 2 from verse 1. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. A fundamental teacher. A teacher of the fundamental doctrine that saves. And a doctrine you know, that is essential. Something solid. You are not on superficial matters. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Verse 7. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine. Showing on corruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Sound speech. That cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you. We're looking at chapter 3 verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Affirm constantly. That they which believe in God may be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Verse 14, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. You see what the Lord is telling us and the church is giving us that we need to remain fundamental on essential things that will get people into the kingdom of God that will get them to heaven. Teach the word. Teach it faithfully. Teach the word. Teach it fearlessly. Teach the word. Teach it fully. Not just in a partial way. You emphasize this and you're not emphasizing the other thing. Teach the word without compromise. Teach the word without corruption. Teach the word without contradiction. Don't contradict yourself. You taught the other week that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And then you come this week again now and you say, actually, uh, you know, everybody knows his weakness. And if, I, if we say we have no sin, who are the we? The ministers. The children of God, no. If we unbelievers who have not been born again, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess and we forsake, he forgives us and then we're justified. And then he says, now go and sin no more. Teach the word for salvation. Teach the word for sanctification. Teach the word for steadfastness. 
to teach the word to produce personal conviction that the people were teaching you don't have to be you know pulling them every time dragging them every time they have conviction they can see it in the word they said that's the word i'm going to obey that teach the word for transparent holiness that the people were teaching as we teach this fundamental truth that personal transparent holiness will be in them teach the word for passionate desire for heaven welcome to point number two restraining false teachers from ministering we're coming to first timothy chapter one verse three first timothy chapter one verse three as i besought thee to abide still at ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. It's not just that we stand on the pulpit and then we preach. I've said everything I need to say. I've said everything I've learned. I preach everything I know. And I backed it up with prayer. It's now in the hands of the people, whether they accept or they reject. And then somebody comes and is contradicting what you're teaching. Contradicting sound doctrine. Contradicting the doctrine that leads us to heaven. And then you sit there and you bow your head and you say, look at this person. Look at what he's doing. And now I cannot challenge him. Because if I challenge him, there are people that appreciate him. There are people that accept what he's saying. Even though I know his contradiction, what can I do? You rise up and you charge them that they teach no other doctrine. You will do it. You can do it. You must do it. You don't have any other choice because this is what it says. It says, I put you there. Are you standing there? Are you standing there? Are you holding on to that ministry so that you charge them to teach no other doctrine? Who are they them? Who are they them? Look at verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they are firm. The people who cannot support what they are teaching, they teach out of how they feel. They teach out of the failure of their own lives. They teach out of hearsay. They teach because they pick this up in that commentary or that commentary. And they cannot affirm and they do not understand the end result of what they are teaching. That it will get the people lost. And it will get them to hell in damnation, everlasting condemnation. They do not understand the outcome of what they are teaching. And now it says, all those people, you charge them that they teach no other doctrine. We're looking at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, from verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. They, they are superficial. Their message does not lead to salvation. Their message does not lead anybody to cry out to God and repent in bitter tears. But the message is even confusing the people who have repented already. The people who are willing to stand on the word of God, they come in as like a serpent, like a snake, and then they begin to say what they are saying, like the serpent beguiled Eve. And then eventually, Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden of Eden. They come in a serpentine way like that. And it says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Verse 11. Give me the first part of that verse 11. Open your Bible and say it well. Say it as if you are going to do it. Whose mouth must be stopped. You know, there are people, they don't follow the Bible anymore. They know that somebody does not have a real grip, a real grasp of the word of God. 
and they are appointing people to preach and to teach. They, they know that that fellow, we don't even know whether he's really saved or backslidden. We don't know whether he has his feet planted on sound doctrine. We don't know from his language. We don't know his, whether he's even part of us or not. You know, he's not sure about anything. And he avoids sanctification when he teaches. He avoids holiness when he teaches. He avoids being categorical when he teaches. It's neither here nor there. And you know them. And then they appoint him. They say, this is what we're going to teach the people of God. Wait. We're talking to thousands of people. We're talking to people who are not sure of the doctrine of salvation, of repentance, of restitution, of righteousness. We're talking to people who do not have, who do not understand what it takes to get to heaven. And then we bring somebody there to talk to them and to confuse them. You cannot do that. If you're a real child of God, if you're a real missionary, you're worth your salt. It says, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not. Teaching things they ought not. They've gone to borrow prayer book from those other people. They've come, they've gone to dig into the things of occultism. They've gone to dig into, you know, what the other people are saying, which they cannot affirm from the word of God. It's just that, you know, you dig out that thing, and there's a generational cause, and there's this, and all that. And they cannot affirm that from those things that we have learned from Jesus, from the apostles, and from the New Testament, they cannot affirm, and then you put them there, go and teach the people. And, and sometimes you even say, go and teach the people, you are not there yourself. You are not hearing what he's saying, and we are not sure about the man. And then he confuses the church. That thing will stop. Whose mouth must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy Lucas sake. But thirteen, this witness is true. Therefore, rebuke them. Rebuke them. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Will be sound in the faith. We're coming to First Timothy chapter four from verse one. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There are doctrines of devils. And the devil cannot preach and tell you how to get to heaven. He's lost heaven himself. He's missing heaven himself. And if there's anything he wants, if there's anything he desires, he wants you to miss heaven. He's fighting against Christ. And he's fighting against the purpose of Christ. And he's fighting against what Christ loves. He hates. And because of that, he brings all these doctrines. And he says, the Spirit is speaking expressly. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. I'll not be among them. I will not depart from the faith. You stand in the faith, whatever may be the challenge and whatever may be the opposition. Here is the faith fundamental. Here is the faith essential. Here is the faith non-negotiable. And then it says, you stand because they give heed to seduce priests, doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. Can you think about this? That some people, instead of proclaiming salvation, salvation in Christ, and proclaiming how we remain in that salvation, how we remain firm, on bending, on compromising, on yielding, on that word of salvation, it's don't eat this one, don't eat this one, don't eat that as word they specialize in now. It says, get them aside and get us people that will teach us the word of God, that will prepare people for the kingdom of God. The Lord will help us. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 11. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 11. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax one tongue against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their false faith. You watch people. The people that have cast off their false conviction, their false faith, 
the first consecration, the first loyalty, the first love, they've cast that off, and the state is still remaining. If you look at verse 13 and with that, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busy bodies, speaking things which they ought not. Speaking things which they ought not. And you find those people, they go from us fellowship to us fellowship. They go from sister to sister, from brother to brother. And the effect of what they are sharing, the effect of, they call it counseling, the effect of their counseling is not making people to stand on the word that gets us ready for the coming of the Lord. It says, you're not going to allow those people to continue having influence in the household of faith. It says, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear, bear children, and guide the house, and give no occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside, tell me, after Satan. You don't want somebody like that to come and teach you. Influenced by the world, influenced by Satan. Influenced by the powers of darkness. You don't want such people to come and teach you anything. That's why it says you stand against them. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 8 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday. Praise the Lord. And today and forever. And then he tells us, look at verse 9 there. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Strange doctrines. Something that is, you know, they are peddling about now. You don't have to be holy now to get to heaven. Everybody will get there. Strange doctrine. You don't have to be righteous to pray now and then to have people heal. There's a technique. There is a method. They have discovered a technique and a method that even if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will still continue working miracles through you. Strange doctrine. Strange doctrine. If uh, your first wife is still alive, you know, there's a way. God looks at everybody as individuals and he understands your peculiarity. You can take that second wife and, you know, forget about that uh, first woman. In fact, uh, you know, a prophet said that she's a witch, you know, strange doctrine. I pray you'll not get there. You will not preach any strange doctrine. You'll not accept any strange doctrine. There are people that accept things because it's convenient for them. They're having family problem. And because of the family problem they're having, somebody brings a strange doctrine and tells them how to get rid of that woman and then get another one. That will not be your portion. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with means which are not which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Looking at um, Galatians chapter two, Galatians chapter two. We're reading here from verses four and five. Galatians chapter two, verses four and five. You not give them chance on your pulpit. I want to hear an amen. amen. Galatians chapter 2 verse 4. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately, privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection. Tell me. No, not for an hour. We'll not give them chance. No, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. The truth of the gospel will continue with every one of us in Jesus' name. Let me ask you a question. You have a family. And you have a young daughter. And you have this teacher very good teacher. 
It's good in maths. It's good in sciences. It's good in everything all around. And then he says, you know, I taught in that family and that, um, you know, the child that taught there had seven distinctions. I taught in that other family and the child that taught there had eight distinctions. And now you say, okay, come on. Come and teach my child. I prize education. I want education. And this young man is teaching your daughter. And then you discover is corrupting your daughter. Apart from the mathematics, apart from the chemistry, apart from the sciences, is doing something else. Is corrupting your daughter. Your daughter that you brought up in the way of the Lord and you are preparing for heaven. Now the young man is good in math and science. From this discovery, are you going to keep him? Just simply look at the church, the family of God. Look at this, this man is clever. This preacher is clever. And when he stands, he speaks authoritatively. But you discover he's corrupting the church. He's poisoning the minds of the people. He's turning their face, their eyes away from the truth that we have learned. But he has talent. But he has ability, he has skill, he can do this well, he can do this well, he can do that well, but the only but is, is corrupting the people and is leading them in the way to perdition. Are we going to keep them? No. You have a mother, and you love your mother, she's mom, she's mommy, but this mother... She said, uh, you know, because you have this, your young people, you're at home, and then you have to go to the office, you have to go here and there, and so say, mom, come, come and take care of our children. And mom does it very well, she changes the diapers, and then she cooks for them, she does everything. The only but is that your children tell you, they say, grandma told us about something they call idol. And said, we can keep it like this and worship like this. And grandma said, we can worship even Satan. And then you just say, mom, my children are telling me something. What are you telling them? Uh, I'm teaching them our way, our culture and tradition. And our tra all this uh, foreign religion that you brought, Jesus, salvation, heaven, born again, born again. I don't know that. What I know is what I'm teaching the children. Teaching your children idolatry and the way to perdition, the way to go to hell. Are you going to keep mommy there? Uh, mommy, please, you need to go back to the village. If you will not accept salvation, and then the young people were bringing up, you are bringing them back into idolatry, mommy, today, today, your pa can go. Will you do that? Of course you will. It was some friend. You love him like nobody else. But then you discover that this bosom friend is leading your children into the way of hell. And yet you love him. You're not going to accept that. You say, we are going to part ways. Because these children, you're an adult. You can make your own choice. You want to go to hell? That's, that's your decision. But these ones that God has given me, I'm going to take care of them. I and my family will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. The same thing we're saying, that the family of God needs people that have conviction. The family of God needs people that will stand on the fundamental truth of the word of God. And if there is anyone, no matter how clever, no matter how talented, no matter how rich, no matter how wealthy, no matter how useful, in other ways, if he brings in false doctrine, we're not going to allow him. Whose mouth must be stopped. They will be stopped in Jesus' name. Now what's the, what are you going to do? Now we're coming back to uh, First Timothy chapter 1. Point number 3. Reproducing faithful teachers for multiplication. Reproducing faithful teachers for multiplication. We're coming to uh, First Timothy chapter 1 and we're looking at verse 3. In verse 3, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest, mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. What's the implication of that? You are charging them to teach the right doctrine. 
You're charging them to teach the heavenly doctrine. You're charging them to teach Christ's doctrine. Why are you doing that? Because you want to reproduce in them faithful teachers, faithful ministers. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Let's read that together. After 2, 1, 2, 3, go. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying? He said, by the grace of God, the Lord gave it to me. I remained faithful with the word of God. Much water has passed under the bridge. I remained faithful to the word of God. There has been opposition in Thessalonica, in Philippi, and in Asia. I have remained faithful to the word of God. I have committed that word to you, Timothy. And by the grace of God, I have found you faithful. Now you are going to do what I have done to you. You are committed to all the men, faithful men, who shall be able, who will have the ability and the skill and the courage and the backbone and the conviction and the commitment to teach other people also, he's saying, uh, reproduce yourself in the people following after you. Reproducing faithful teachers. Paul, the apostle that God used to give it to you, he has remained faithful. And then you, by the grace of God, you are faithful. And then you are finding out in the congregation. You are finding out in the ministry. You are finding out, you are selecting them. You are finding them out. And these men and women, they will be faithful people. In fact, that's what Jesus did. And because Jesus did that, you can do it too. You will do it in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6 verse 7. The reason why we do this is so that there will be multiplication, multiplication, multiplication of ministers, multiplication of churches, multiplication of members. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 6 verse 7, and the word of God increased, it will increase in our midst. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of uh, the priests were obedient to the faith. It happened before, it will happen again. And by the grace of God, it will be done through you and through me in Jesus' name. We're looking at chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 31. Chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Spirit were, tell me the word, multiplied. There will be multiplication. Multiplication of workers. Tell me a good amen. amen. Multiplication of local churches. Amen. amen. A multiplication of faithful teachers and pastors in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we do that? How did Jesus do that? How did Jesus reproduce himself in those disciples? Number one, he transformed them. He transformed them. You can tell how they eventually were totally transformed. The fearful became fearless and the uh, coward became courageous. They were transformed. Your teaching, your interaction with the people of God should transform. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they had been uh, that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them uh, that they had been uh, with Jesus. They marveled when they saw their boldness, their fearlessness, because number one, he transformed them. Number two, he taught them. And this is what we have to do. If you are to reproduce good ministers. And if you have to reproduce faithful teachers in the people, you must teach the people. He taught them. He taught them. We're looking at Mark chapter 14, verse 49. Mark chapter 14, 
Reading from verse 49, here is what we do. Here is how to do it. I was daily with you in the temple. And the disciples were there with him. I was daily with you in the temple teaching. And you took me not. But the scriptures, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. He taught them daily. Number one, tell me. He transformed them. You yourself must be transformed. And then God will use you as an agent to transform the people you are bringing. Number two, tell me. He taught them. Number three, he tamed them. He tamed them. If you know what, uh, my, what uh, these uh, disciples were before, let's show you two of them. We're looking at Mark chapter 3, verse 17. Mark chapter 3, verse 17. And, G and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, is named Bonages, which is, what's that? The sons of thunder. The sons of thunder. Look at chapter 9 of Luke. Luke chapter 9. Talking about James and John. Luke chapter 9. Reading from verse 51. In verse 51, And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Even as Elias did, and he turned and rebuilt them, and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Look at those the people, disciples, the people that Christ was preparing, that they will take over. And they will preach the gospel, the fundamental doctrine that saves and that makes salvation available to everyone. They wanted to call down fire to burn up those people. But he tamed them. He tamed them. Let's look at the end result. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. We're reading here from verse 17. It says, Herein is our love made perfect. This John talking, and not just talking about himself, our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. They have been tamed. He transformed them. He taught them. He tamed them. He tested them. You see, as you are, you're not just preaching and preaching and preaching, teaching and teaching and teaching. You test them. You ask them questions. And you look at their response. And so you are able to know where they are at and at what point they are now. And then you will know what still to teach them. Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked, his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and or one of the prophets. He says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Tell me, Thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. He tested them. He wanted them to know. You don't want to commit the ministry into the hands of somebody you are not even sure of. That when it comes to the time to stand, whether he'll declare Jesus Christ as the Christ and the Son of God or not. We're looking at John chapter 6. He tested them. John chapter 6, reading from verse 6 to 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, 
Will you also go away? It's a test. He tested them. He wanted to know what's in their heart, what's in their mind, what's their decision, and what will they do when the fire gets hotter? It says, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Thank God you passed the test. You all passed your test. He trained them. He trained them. Teaching is one thing. And training the people and preparing them for ministry, that's another thing. So that you are repro your life is reproduced in them. So that Christ's life is reproduced in them. And what was, was his goal? The goal of that training, he trained them. Luke chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 40. Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 40. Here is it. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. That was the goal of Christ, and that is still his goal. He will perfect whatever is lacking in you in Jesus' name. Number one, he transformed them. Number two, he taught them. Number three, he tamed them. Number four, he tested them. Number five, he trained them. Number six, he travailed for them. He travailed for them. He prayed for them. He knew their weakness. And then he spent time praying for them. We must pray for the people we are developing. We are developing them, transforming them. They were converts, they become disciples. Disciples, they became apostles. First, they were stable. Then they were stable. Then they were steadfast. Then they were strong. Because it travailed for them. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. The Lord is praying for you. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And then, number seven, he toughened and tempered them. On the one hand, he toughened them, made them tough. By the life he lived, that, that they could see. On the other hand, he made them tender. He tempered them. John chapter seven. John chapter 7, reading from verse 25. John chapter 7, verse 25. Then said some of them, some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? They were watching him. And you learned by observation. As they looked at him, they said, the people were saying, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. And then he showed up. And then he began to talk to them. And he spoke to them boldly. Until the people were wondering, about this a man? They were planning to kill. Look at him speaking boldly. Then, many people, because of that belief, they said, this indeed is the Christ. On the one hand, he toughened them. On the other hand, he tempered them. We're looking at uh, chapter 13 of John. John chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 3. John chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. And that he was come from God and went to God. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments. And took a towel and guarded himself. After that, he put water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was guarded. And when he got to Peter, Peter said, Lord, what are you doing? 
you wash my feet. No, you will not wash my feet. He wanted them to understand we can be tough-minded and yet we can be tender. He tempered them. And then he told them in verse 13, you call me Lord, Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another speed. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Look at the training method of the Lord Jesus Christ transforming and teaching and taming and testing and training and traveling and toughening and tempering. I pray the Lord will do it for you and raise you up a militant, courageous leader and teacher in Jesus' name. And then you will do it to other people, and then you will be a change agent in the lives of other people in Jesus' name. To summarize, what do you do? Number one, receive him. I know you received him as Savior, as your Lord, as your Master. Receive him as your king. Receive him as the final authority in your life. And just the same way as you got saved. I said, Lord, I receive you as my personal savior. Take all my sins away. You receive him now as the final authority in your life. Looking unto him, the author and the finisher of your faith. Receive him. Number two, recommit to him. Bring your life once again and recommit your life unto the Lord. Lord, I know the charge you have given me. I know the challenge you have given me. I know the calling, the commission you have given me. And I recommit myself unto you. Number three, remember him. Anytime you face any challenge, you face any difficulty, remember him. What will Christ do? What will Christ say? How will Christ respond? Will Christ remain and abide in the ministry God the Father has given him? Remember him. Number four, reverence him. Reverence him. Forget about yourself. Forget about your pain. Forget about your pleasure. Forget about your desires. Forget about your challenges. And say, I give the honor, the respect unto him who died for me. Request of him. You say, Lord, I'm weak, make me strong. I'm losing focus, grant me focus. I want to go the right direction. Lead me the right direction. Your request of him, resemble him. Resemble him. You want to, anyone that sees me, I want them to see Jesus. I want them to see his courage in me, his fearlessness in me, his boldness in me, his authority in me, his power in me. I want to resemble him. Number seven, reproduce him. In your life, reproduce him. In the lives of the people you are teaching, your goal is so that they will be like him. You always have that goal and that purpose in everything you do. John chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the same works that I do shall he do. And greater works than this shall he do, because I go unto my Father. He'll do everything that needs to be done to reproduce himself in you. He will do it. Will you let him? I said, will you allow him? Rise up and tell the Lord. You remember all that we have learned today? A compelling charge. A compelling charge for Christian ministers. Open your mouth, open your mouth and tell the Lord, he'll do it, he'll do it.